surprised, apparently, a statue of Moloch. A statue of Moloch, the ancient god known for child sacrifice, which has now been put on display in Rome uh, at the Colosseum, which is today popularly known as a site of ancient Christian martyrdom where the Christians in centuries past under old pagan Rome were condemned because they refused to acknowledge the pagan gods. In fact, Christians were called atheists, atheists, meaning against the gods. And uh, their response collectively was that no, that the pagans were the real atheists. They were, they were against the true god, the only true God, the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity. But because they refused to acknowledge the pagan gods, they were condemned. They were often thrown to the lions. They were crucified. They were burned alive and so on. Uh, the Christians were, well, Nero famously burned the city of Rome and blamed it on the Christians. And uh, very interesting. The, but all of that is behind the history of the Colosseum. Now there at the Colosseum, this uh, big bronze-looking statue of Moloch has been erected and put on display and is uh, there for a time. And who knows whether they're going to keep it there indefinitely. It is said to be part of a large-scale exhibition titled Carthago, the immortal myth, apparently a, uh, a, a memory, a revival of, let's see, it says, here's an article from LifeSite News. It says that it is part of an exhibit dedicated to ancient Rome's once great rival, the city of Carthage, the Carthaginians. Okay, for those who know the histories of the Punic Wars with the uh, great Carthaginian general Hannibal, who crossed the Alps famously with his elephants and fought a number of great battles against Rome, uh, devastating Roman armies, etc. Hannibal, however, was eventually defeated, and the ancient city of Carthage was utterly annihilated. But it is believed, apparently, that they worshipped the god Molech. Molech, who is said to be the counterpart of Baal, and quite possibly one in the same. If you study the, the uh, pagan gods of the ancient mysteries, and if you read the writings of those who talk about them and the ancient mystery worship, quite often the, these pagan gods were intertwined. They, they were different aspects of the same thing which we'll talk about more later on. But biblically, uh, if you read Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21, God says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So the whole idea of causing their children to pass through the fires of Molech, uh, offering them as a child sacrifice. That is probably the most common understanding of the pagan god Molech. But you find similar, uh, a similar uh, passage in Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse 5, where it says, uh, They have built also the high places of Baal, to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. So God there is confronting and rebuking the children of Israel because they built these high places to Baal. So both Baal and Molech were ancient pagan gods that human, that children typically were offered up as a human sacrifice. That's why this image of Molech uh, is so startling and really horrific to many people. You read the articles on this. People in who are going to Rome and they're going to the Colosseum, they're horrified because they put the statue there right near the entrance. So anybody who goes there is going to encounter this big demon god, Molech. Now, why is this being done? Why, you know, to have a, 
a remembrance of the ancient Carthaginians, which certainly you could do that as, as a historic remembrance of some kind. But why would they set up some big statue of a demon god right there at the Colosseum, which in modern history is remembered as a place of Christian martyrdom? Well, I would contend this is part of the ongoing agitation, anti-Christ agitation of the Jesuits who run the Vatican. Uh, we did a story, or we did a show talking about the story uh, of, at the uh, Vatican's uh, Jesuit University, the Gregorian Pontifical Gregorian University there in Rome, where they had a, an exhibit that was promoting witchcraft and all of this anti-Christian ideology was being promoted. Uh, LifeSite News did a story on this, and the headline said, Vatican's Jesuit University in Rome hosts anti-Catholic exhibit featuring homosexual couple witch. Okay, now LifeSite News, for those who don't know, is a Catholic publication. But they were they're just promoting through this exhibit uh, all these things having to do with homosexuality, with occultism, witchcraft, um, trying trying to normalize anti-Christian ideologies, uh, featuring a a girl who's part of some humanist youth group in Norway, uh, and and yet turned away from Christianity, was raised by Christian parents and turned away from Christianity. It's like the Jesuits are continually promoting all of these anti-Christian ideas to really try and trample on and eradicate Christianity. And really what they're doing there, on the one hand, they're fighting against Christianity, Bible-based Christianity, but they're also fighting against traditional Catholicism. And it's why we point people to the book by Malachi Martin, who was the uh, uh, a former Jesuit who wrote extensively once he left the order. But he wrote the book on the Jesuits and the betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church because he believed that the Jesuits were systematically betraying the principles of historic Catholicism, uh, which they are, which is kind of a strange dynamic. Um. You read the article here. This is, you have the European Union Times talking about this. And here is what they said. European Union Times. Their headline says, Vatican mounts giant statue of demon Moloch at Roman Colosseum entrance. Now remember, some people right off the bat, just as a side note, will remember that for many years, whenever anybody talks about what's going on here in the United States and they talk about the Bohemian Grove, the infamous Bohemian Grove in Northern California, you have that giant carved image of, a, of what appears to be an owl-type figure, an idolatrous-looking image that is said to be an image of the god Moloch. And that could very well be the case. That's typically what is said uh, but now why would Moloch appear as an owl? That's not necessarily uncommon if you study the pagan gods. They often took different forms. I mean, sometimes Zeus appears as a great eagle, for example. Um, and uh, so that's that's not unusual. And, and again, you'd have to study, for example, Albert Pike, and you'd have to study the Egyptian god of Mendes, the goat or the ram of Mendes, who was called Amun, Amon of Mendes. And Amon, who was this goat-headed or ram-headed god, was said to be the spirit of the gods. And according to Albert Pike in his book, Morals and Dogma, he says that the secret of Amon was that all the other gods, all the other pagan gods, were various representations of him. Okay? And uh, so that is, that's part of understanding, comprehending why the ancient mysteries work the way that they do. It can be confusing if you go read the histories. Um, but anyway, all right, so uh, let's look at this EU Times article, 
where they say, quote, without a doubt, it is truly an abomination that a gigantic statue of Molech is now standing right at the entrance of the Colosseum where so many Christians were brutally slaughtered by the Romans. So look at what the new Italian leftist globalist government is now up to after they kicked Matteo Salvini from power. Can you believe this? This is what the EU Times says. Now, Salvini was known as a staunch conservative, and he was trying to oppose this massive flood of Muslims and immigrants into Italy. And of course, the, the, the radical left despised him and did everything they could to get him out of power. Now that these leftist globalists have gotten in, uh, now, of course, they're trying to undo the things that um, he did. And uh, so anyway, they talk about how uh, further down in the article, it says a source close to the matter told Breaking Israel News that, quote, there is no way that such a thing could be done without direct permission from the highest levels of the Vatican. The Colosseum of Rome is owned by the Vatican and specifically the Diocese of Rome, also called the Holy See. If anyone wants to do anything there, they must get permissions from the office of the Diocese of Rome. This exhibition called Carthago, the Immortal Myth, could not be held there at all unless permissions were granted at high levels. Okay? Then the EU Times goes on, and here's what they say. They say, quote, Well, we told you numerous times in our previous articles that this Pope is Satan himself. We nicknamed him Pope Satan. Just do a search on our website for Pope Satan. And uh, then they say, this isn't just some random ancient deity. In Leviticus 18.21, the people of Israel are specifically warned against sacrificing their children to this monstrous idol. Now, what I find very interesting, just reading that note there, about how the children of Israel were warned about sacrificing their children to Molech. You look at what's going on, the assault on children throughout the Western world, the historically Christian countries, what they're doing to children in terms of preying upon them with the LGBT movement. You have the abortion movement that's gone on for many years where, where unborn, partly born, and sometimes reportedly fully born children are being killed and then their bodies torn in pieces and sold on the black market. What is happening to children? I mean, they're going after the kids. It's like the devil is inspiring uh, his agents to go after the most vulnerable and most innocent members of our society in complete rejection of all the laws and the commands that we have in the Holy Scripture that really protect children, which the Christian world historically is known for doing. And now this image of Molech uh, seems to suggest, based on its history, uh, the complete rejection of the idea of protecting our kids according to the commandments of God. It's very disturbing, very disturbing to think about it. All right, let's go to a commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk more right after this. Uh, starting at verse 25, this is one of the passages in the scripture that inspired uh, me years ago with the founding of Adullam Films and the kind of work that we do. Um, but let's read Ezekiel 22, verse 25. It says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. God is confronting ancient Israel and the priests and the prophets of ancient Israel. And so verse 25, he says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. Think about what we read in the New Testament, where Peter tells us that Satan goes around, goes about like a roaring lion. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, 
neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. Uh, we could we could talk about what is happening in America and the Western world within the context of those verses. You look at the ecumenical movement, the ecumenical movement that is trying to blend all of the pagan religions of the world with Christianity and telling everyone that these are all one and the same thing somehow, that there's really no difference between them. This, I believe, is, is what is being confronted, what God is condemning in Ezekiel chapter 22, putting no difference between the holy things of God and those profane things that are not of God. And notice the Lord says there's a conspiracy of prophets. Next time somebody tells you the Bible doesn't mention conspiracies or whatever, it most certainly does. And that, that's one example. One example a conspiracy of prophets. Think about who's involved in this uh, false, corrupt, antichrist, ecumenical movement. You have uh, Catholic priests, we know. You have the Jesuits. You have many evangelicals. You have uh, leaders from different denominations who all appear to be conspiring together toward ecumenical arguments. Uh, now the promotion of the LGBT uh, apostasy in many of the churches and in just more and more denominations. This is creeping in and getting control. And uh, the statue here of Moloch uh, seems to be a step in that direction. Now, I want to read from uh, one of the commentaries. This is from the Benson commentary. The Benson commentary on uh, pass through the fire to Molech and what this signifies in Leviticus chapter 18. And he begins by talking about how there are some who believe that uh, Molech, who is also called Milcom, was the idol of the Ammonites. The name signifies king. That's what the, what the word or the name Molech means. It means king. And so uh, the idea of passing through the fire of Molech, some have argued that this could be some kind of rite of purification whereby parents consecrate their children by either waving them over the fire or making them walk between the fires or jumping over the fire. These are the different things. If you read a variety of commentaries, you'll find that. However, the traditional view is given by a scholar named Selden, who, Benson says, has given a large account of this idol and of the rites with which it was worshipped, and that he shows from several testimonies that the Phoenicians and other nations in the neighborhood of Judea actually sacrificed their children in times of great calamity to this bloodthirsty demon. So you have a variety of opinions, but sooner or later it comes down to literal child sacrifice. Uh, he goes on, he says, uh, uh, quote, Phagius informs us, that the image of Molech was of brass, contrived with seven cells or receptacles, probably representing the seven planets. The first for receiving an offering of flour, the second of turtle doves, the third for a ewe, the fourth for a ram, the fifth for a calf, the sixth for an ox, the seventh for a child, who, being shut up in this cell as in a furnace, was therein burned to death while, peop while the people danced about the idol and beat timbrels, drums. They beat drums that the cries of the tormented infant might not be heard. We have authority from the sacred writings to believe that these nations actually sacrifice their children to that grim idol in some such horrid manner. Now, if you were also to go over to uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, 2 Kings chapter 23, when we're reading there about 
the work of King Josiah when he's reforming ancient Israel, uh, where it says in 23 verse 7, he break down the houses of the Sodomites. Notice sodomy had become normalized in the land, but now he's read the law of God. He realizes sodomy is not acceptable, so he breaks down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. Okay? And then in verse 10, it says, And he defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. To pass through the fire to Molech. Now, you have um, in the Benson commentary as well, he says it is supposed to be called Topeth from Toph, T-O-P-H, Toph, a drum. Because they beat drums at the burning of their children that their shrieks might not be heard. So there again, just like we heard in the other commentary, that's what they were known for, the beating of the drum. Well, apparently the Valley of Topeth was so named because it was like the Valley of the Drums. Because there they beat the drums. Really a chilling, terrifying thought that they're, they're beating these drums specifically to drown out the sound of the cries of these infants that they're burning alive to Molech. And they, they're, they're, they're pounding the drums. Why? There's other commentaries that talk about how they were fearful that the parent who had delivered their child up in this way might somehow or other become emotional at hearing their child crying and then want to go rescue their child from the, uh, the arms of the demon god Molech. And uh, so they would pound the drum to keep them from hearing uh, the sound of their cries. Just absolutely, perfectly horrific. And for anybody who knows the history of the pagan god Molech, Molech is, I mean, it just represents all of the, the wickedness, the evil, the savagery, the barbarity uh, of the old pagan world that Christianity and God's law overturns and put a stop to. And great kings, great ancient kings like Josiah, put a stop to this wicked practice. Uh, you have a poem from Milton, the great Puritan writer Milton, where he says of Molech, quote, Horrid king, besmeared with blood, of human sacrifice and parents' tears, though for the noise of drums and timbrels loud, their children's cries unheard, that passed through the fire to his grim idol. And that's from Paradise Lost, Book One. All right, brethren. We are out of time. That is going to do it for us today. That is our show. Every year, unfortunately, here in the United States, most people are celebrating Halloween, which is by no means the favored uh, Christian holiday. It's not a Christian holiday at all. It's a pagan holiday that has nothing to do with Christianity. And, uh, you know, it's been a point of controversy. I mean, you've got all of this information out there where churches for years now have been doing the trunk or treat option where they have at the church people pull in with their cars and then they open their trunks and the kids go around everybody's car and then they hand out candy from the trunk of the car this is the alternative and i suppose that's not a horrible alternative but I have to admit, and I've talked about this on and off for several years now, I greatly prefer what they are doing at the Providence Classical Christian School in Bothell, Washington. Bothell, Washington, where they actually celebrate Reformation Day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Go look this up at uh, www.pccs.org. School Life Reformation Day. They say, uh, they say uh, quote, if you walk into Providence's building at the end of October expecting to see students sporting their usual Providence blue and green, you may be surprised. Instead of trim uniforms and dressy shoes, you discover colorful costumes and props everywhere you look. 
flowing skirts, archery, bows, armor, cloaks, a whole parade of creativity. Then it goes on, and it says, uh, in all their diversity and creativity, the costumes all seem to reflect one particular era, Europe, around the year 1500. In fact, without realizing it, you have joined Providence just in time for our celebration of a particularly important moment in church history, Reformation Day. And then they show um, uh, pictures of the kids there. And these look like young kids, um, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, right around there. But they're all dressed up like Reformation era characters. They're, they are remembering the history of Reformation Day. And I have to tell you, just, just based on the pictures, knowing nothing else about what they're doing there at the school, although it does seem that they are teaching a classical Christian education, which I think is fantastic. I wish our country could return to that standard, that we put the Bible back in the schools, uh, that we put prayer back in the schools, at least morning prayer, uh, and we set the minds of our children back on focus as a nation rather than allowing these Marxists to get in there and brainwash everybody with all of this paganism and their social justice, socialism uh, indoctrination that is just ruinous uh, for the, the mental health, quite frankly, of our young people. Our young people are becoming more and more deranged, especially by the time they graduate high school and get into college. It's a nightmare. As a Christian parent, you definitely have your work cut out for you. Uh, we definitely have to remind our children continually of the way of the Lord, which we should be doing anyway. We should be doing anyway, definitely. But I, I stumbled upon this. There is also another school that I found, uh, Clear Lake Classical, which is in Iowa. Clear Lake Classical which is in Iowa, and they also celebrate Reformation Day, and they've got uh, pictures of the same, although not as many photos, so it's hard to see entirely what they're doing, but they seem to be following the same theme. Now, I don't know, I haven't done enough research into either of these schools to know if they even pay any attention at all to Halloween, but certainly the acknowledgement of Reformation Day as an alternative is, I think, so important to us here in America. It's really important to the entire Western world. And many, I, I would even argue the entire rest of the world should know about the history of the Great Reformation. And it's not just about Martin Luther nailing his 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. Unfortunately, many people see it that way because our education system has removed the real history, the full history of the Reformation. Certainly, Luther was a main character in that whole history. There's no question. Luther, later on, Calvin. But there are so many other figures uh, who did so many different things and had so many different teachings. It was an entire movement. And I, I would say to anybody, if you have the opportunity to go to Geneva, Switzerland at some point, I had the opportunity. There were a number of us with the Dullam Films. We went over to Europe, as I've told you before, doing some filming for our upcoming documentary, The True Christian History of America, where we're going to talk more about the influence of the Reformation into the New World. Um, but we went to Geneva. We went to the International Museum of the Reformation, which I highly recommend if you're in that city at some point, if you have the opportunity to go, uh, be sure you go to the uh, Reformers Wall, the Reformation Wall, which is actually called the International Monument to the Reformation, which is great to see because it was built about 1907 before they started rewriting the history books. So the understanding on the monument is that the, the Reformation beginning with Wycliffe and Huss and then Luther and then others, a number of other figures that you're, you're not going to be as familiar with, uh, people like Admiral Colony, the leader of the Huguenots and others, that the Reformation ultimately brings you to the pilgrims landing in America. 
and they have the Mayflower Compact there. And they're showing uh, how the Mayflower Compact and the fact that the pilgrims landed there for the express purpose of the advancement of the Christian faith, the advancement of the preaching of the gospel. Why? Because the Lord says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, it used to be that this was well known in our country, brothers and sisters. Uh, here is a speech. I'm going to read part of this speech from Samuel Adams, Adams, who was a Christian man. And I believe he had a reformed Christian worldview based on my study of Sam Adams. And this was a speech that Adams gave right before he signed the Declaration of Independence. Here's what he said. And, and I'm not going to be able to read the whole speech. I'm just going to read a portion of it. But it's one that shows the importance of the Reformation into the development and founding of America. So Adams said this. He said, quote, Our forefathers threw off the yoke of popery in religion. For you is reserved the honor of leveling the popery of politics. He goes on, he says, This day I trust the reign of political Protestantism will commence. We have explored the temple of royalty and found that the idol we have bowed down to has eyes which see not, ears that hear not our prayers, and a heart like the nether millstone. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom alone men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and with a propitious eye beholds his subjects, assuming that freedom of thought and dignity of self-direction which he bestowed on them. From the rising to the setting sun, may his kingdom come. Praise the Lord. So that is just part of a speech. The, the speech itself, if you look it up, is significantly longer than all of that. But those are portions of the speech given by Samuel Adams after the Declaration of Independence had been agreed to. And they had, they had finalized the wording, and now they were getting ready to all sign this uh, famous, soon-to-be-famous document. And uh, Adams understood that the principles involve the idea of the laws of nature and of nature's God. That phrase is based on Psalm chapter 19 and Romans chapters 1 and 2. The idea that God gave two great witnesses, the witness of the creation and then the witness of the word of God, divine revelation. You have to read Blackstone uh, and others uh, to understand their, their view of that, but this was uh, a Christian teaching that went back centuries before the American Revolution. But anyway, n none of the acknowledgement of that, the components of it, none of that would have been possible without the Great Reformation and the recovery of the Bible. And what's incredible to me, this, this is my impression now, when I was in Geneva and was going through the International museum to the Reformation and so on, and I had a chance to, to interact with people there, the general impression, what they generally understand about the Reformation is that the Reformation gave the common people the right to read the Bible in their own language. That's the main thing. And I've talked before on this show about uh, the woman that I met there. I met an older woman there who just in passing through the museum had, had said bonjour to me, because that's what they say, they speak French. So she said bonjour, and I said, oh, hello. And she said, hello. And I, I said, yes, I'm an American. And then we started talking. And then uh, she was talking about the reformers, and she spoke very favorably of them. And I said to her, I said, so are you a, a Protestant then? And she said, oh, no, I'm Catholic. She said, but I think very much like a Protestant. And I said, really? I was kind of surprised. I'd never heard anybody make those exact comments. And she said, yes, because I believe I should have the right to read the Bible uh, for myself and pray to God and understand the scriptures uh, you know, according to my own conscience. That's basically what she said in a nutshell. And I was really kind of fascinated by that testimony. I'd never, I don't think I've ever met anybody who said quite that. 
but she said, uh, you know, if I'd been alive during the Reform era, I would have been a Protestant back then, I can tell you. Uh, that's what she said. And so we talked for another minute, and then she had to go. Uh, but it was, it was very interesting that in that part of the world, people understand the Reformation in a very simple way. Do you have the right to worship God according to your own conscience? Do you have the right to read God's word so that your salvation, the condition of your soul, the exercise of your conscience is ultimately, of course, Paul says we can have 10,000 teachers in Christ, but ultimately, every man's soul stands before the Lord. God says all souls are mine. Paul says we, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, so yes, we can admonish each other, we can teach each other, we can, but what we should be doing overwhelmingly is pointing one another to the Word of God, to the Holy Scripture. And we're going to go to our commercial break here in a moment, and when we come back, we are going to talk about one of the uh, lesser well-known figures. He's a well-known figure, but he's not as well-known, let's say, as Luther, Calvin, and others. Uh, but Ulrich Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, who was the great uh, Swiss reformer. Uh, we're going to talk about Zwingli and some of what he taught and believed on these issues when we come back from the break right after this. A, uh, just a short portion of this song. It's called Reformation Song, uh, and you can find it on YouTube, posted by the Grace Emmanuel Bible Church. Reformation Song. And part of the lyrics are, Through faith alone we come to you. We have no merit we can claim. Sure that your promises are true, we place our hope in Jesus' name. Uh, here, let's listen to the chorus. All right, so you can you can hear what a what a beautiful song that is, and it looks like a really a great con congregation there at the Grace Emanuel Bible Church. I'm not sure where that is, but you can find them online. You can certainly find them in this song on YouTube. Uh, but it's I thought it was great. I found it online. I have to have to tell you, I know nothing about the church beyond this song, but I thought it was great that somebody put together a Reformation song. Uh, I also think it's great that we have schools now, Christian schools, that are celebrating Reformation Day. I would love to see our country phase out Halloween and replace it with a, a much more worthy holiday and one that I think would unite the Christian community. If it was presented the right way, I think it could unite the Christian community. Uh, right now, I think Trunk or Treat and the Harvest Festival things that they're doing, I'm just not sure that's really the, uh, that's really a significant alternative. And what we're losing as a culture and as a country and as the church, uh, what we're losing in terms of the knowledge of the Reformation and all of the blessings that God has poured out upon not only Christian people, but the people of the world as a result of the Great Reformation. Because the Reformation was a back to the Bible movement. It was a, you know, sola scriptura, I believe, is probably the most important principle that was recovered. Because sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, that takes a person uh, to everything else. That takes a person to salvation, to understanding the importance of the glory of God alone, uh, faith alone, 
grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone, all the rest of it follows once the Holy Scriptures are plainly laid before the eyes of the people. Kind of partly quoting William Tyndale there. Uh, but that was Tyndale's uh, hope. That was his ambition. Uh, that was the ambition of Desiderius Erasmus and many others. Uh, another Reformation incident, I'm going to go back two years to October 31st, 2017, at the 500-year anniversary. The uh, great Christian leader, Reformed Christian leader, Victor Orban. Victor Orban gave a speech commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, he celebrated the Reformation. He celebrated Christianity. He is a Christian man. Right now, Viktor Orban is one of the politicians over in Europe that is trying to resist the globalist attempt to flood Western Europe with all of these Muslims and foreigners and really systematically undermine and overthrow Christian civilization. He recognizes it. And in Hungary, they are putting up a, a fight against it. Hungary and Poland in particular are two countries that are really resisting this. Here, this is the subtitle for the article on this. It says, quote, speaking at a celebratory event, marking the 500th anniversary of the start of Reformation on Tuesday, the Hungarian prime minister said that it is no accident but an expression of God's mercy that Hungary currently has a Christian government which promotes faith. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Orban, whenever you see him in the news, remember, he's not just a professing Christian, but he is a reformed Christian. Uh, in fact, he even says uh, in his speech, he says, quote, the leaders of our church asked me to address you today. No doubt they asked me because they felt it to be right that at the final gathering of this 500th anniversary, I should speak on behalf of the Hungarian government, both as prime minister and a member of the Reformed Church. Now keep that in mind as you consider this Newsweek headline uh, because Trump met earlier this month with Prime Minister Orban at the White House, and Newsweek had a headline. They said, quote, White House officials tried blocking Trump from meeting Hungary's far-right prime minister because they feared pair would get along too well. In other words, they feared the pair of them. That's what they're saying. They feared that they would get along too well. And, of course, they are uh, calling Orban a far-right uh, prime Minister. Why? Because he is a traditional Christian man who actually believes in protecting Christian civilization and does not believe that all of these Muslims should be brought into Western Europe and these Christian countries handed over to Islam one step at a time. And oh my goodness, what an extremist position for him to have to try and put a stop to that, which he is most certainly doing. Orban is known for this. All right, well, before we went to the break, I mentioned one of the great Reformation figures uh, who was Ulrich Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli out of Switzerland. I remember studying so many of these reformers years ago. I'd actually written a dramatic production uh, for a church that I was attending in California many years ago. And uh, Zwingli was one of the characters that we uh, chose to, to represent. But Zwingli, he was responsible for the Swiss reform. And of course, like the other reformers, he called for uh, a return to the Bible, uh, the Bible as the foundation of the Christian faith. Uh, Zwingli published his 67 thesis. Instead of a 95 thesis, he had a 67 uh, thesis that was published in the year 1523. And some of the, uh, the more significant declarations that he made was, one, that Christ is the only way to salvation for all who ever were, are, and shall be. Uh, also, he said, quote, Christ is the only mediator between God and ourselves. 
And of course, this was very, very important at that point in history because you had the papacy, the popes were drawing everybody to the priests, to the sacraments of the Church of Rome, and arguing that if you didn't go through these sacraments, and if it wasn't an ordained uh, priest of Rome that administered them to you, then you could not be saved. They made it a salvation issue in violation of what the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 1. Um, Zwingli also said that if ministers are unfaithful and transgress the laws of Christ, they may be deposed in accordance with God's will. That was something else. You had the priesthood, the Catholic priesthood, uh, where the priests were often corrupt, and yet there was virtually no accountability. We're seeing that today. How many of these predator priests of Rome are just shuffled about from one parish to another, and there's no consequence for them, or very little consequence? Uh, Zwingli also taught that, quote, whoever remits any sin only for the sake of money is the companion of Simon Magus and Balaam and a real messenger of the devil. So he condemned simony, the idea of really the, the same thing Luther had argued, the same thing that even John Wycliffe had argued back uh, even before Luther uh, against indulgences, the idea of getting money to forgive somebody's sins, to atone for somebody's sins? No, uh, Christ paid for our sins on the cross. When he cried out, it is finished, literally. He cried out, it is tetelestai. It is paid in full. Praise the Lord. All right, brethren, we are out of time for today. That's going to do it for us. That's our show. We'll stop it there. But we will be back and the Armenian Genocide. Now, The Dark Agenda, that is actually the title of a book by David Horowitz. David Horowitz, who is uh, a former radical leftist, he's written a, a number of uh, books out there confronting socialism, communism, and its infiltration of our system. Uh, David Horowitz is Jewish. He is, from what I understand, an agnostic. He's not a, he's not a Christian. Hopefully he will be at some point. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about his testimony, which I find to be very, very interesting from his perspective, coming out of the radical left, becoming a conservative, uh, trying to defend our historic value system, and the point that he arrived at, which is a defense of Christianity, that without Protestant Christianity in particular, uh, the values of our country would not exist. And remember, political Protestantism, as uh, Samuel Adams referred to it, uh, Protestantism is Bible-based Christianity. It, it's simply Christianity based on the Bible. At least that's the ambition of Protestantism. Now, obviously, we know in the Protestant evangelical community that not all churches are necessarily going to be biblical. You, you've got, and that's, that's a whole conversation, that Christians are having every day. But the original ambition of the Protestant movement was to get back to the Bible and to believe what Jesus said when he said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now that, of course, is uh, from Matthew 4.4, 4. Luke 4.4, 4, and Matthew 4.4. 4. Um, uh, but Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone or by bread alone, etc. Uh, but that is, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, where it says that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. I think it's important to acknowledge that what God says in Deuteronomy and what Jesus affirms in the New Testament is that the Lord does not say Israel. He does not say the children of Israel. He says man, to make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word 
that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, out of the mouth of God. So it's mankind. Mankind needs the word of God. And that is at the very heart of what historic Protestantism was and is supposed to be. Now, we've talked about on the program before, and we still carry the book. In fact, I think we've still got a few copies uh, of the book by Dr. Ronald Cook that he wrote called The De-Protestantizing of America. The De-Protestantizing of America. Why? Because he, he he's a Reformed teacher from Ulster, Northern Ireland. He was a lifelong friend of uh, the late Dr. Ian Paisley. And, of course, Dr. Cook appears in our film series, the History of the Bible series. And uh, his book, The Deprotestantizing of America, has to do with the fact that America was founded based upon Protestant Christianity, Protestantism. And it has over, well, about the last hundred years or so, especially since the end of World War II, the deprotestantizing of America is the systematic removal of and denial of the historic Protestant history of our country. Uh, but here, here's what I want to do. I want to play a clip here. This is from an interview with uh, David Horowitz when he is being interviewed by Mike Huckabee on Mike Huckabee's uh, internet show. And here's what he says. Listen to David Horowitz's testimony here, and he actually gives a warning to Christians in America. Listen. Why on earth would a Jewish guy like David Horowitz write a book defending Christianity? No, because I realized I'm, I'm an agnostic. I was a leader of the new left radicals when I saw... Uh, how destructive they were. I had to reevaluate America. And I saw that America could only have been created by Christians and by Protestant Christians. We don't teach that in the schools anymore. But every value that we hold, uh, whether it's equality, inclusion, and diversity, these are all Christian values. Uh, and the left hates, hates them, hates Christians because they hate America. I know that... Uh, you no know, Christians are focused on the, the next world, on saving your immortal souls. But if you don't defend uh, your rights now, if you don't defend Christianity now, you're not going to have any. There won't be churches. David, they, they will destroy them. Wow. So uh, you can hear there uh, David Horowitz, and and he's again he's he describes himself as an agnostic. Uh, I've, I've heard similar testimonies from other people who are either Jewish, but they're not necessarily Messianic Jewish, uh, people who are atheists, people who are not part of the Christian evangelical community, and they are, as they're watching Islam systematically invade the Western world, and then they're watching the radical leftists become more and more extreme is the more peace-loving non-Christian people are looking around and they're saying, okay, when are the Christians going to wake up and do something here? Because Christians are still the majority in the Western world, in Western Europe and in America. Uh, but they've, they're going to have to wake up and do something here because uh, these dark and evil forces are getting worse and worse and more and more radical. And people who want to live peaceably are recognizing that that is not the agenda of the left. That's not the agenda of the, uh, the, the Marxists or the Sharia Muslims who are coming into the Western world. That's not their purpose. Uh, for people who are, I mean, if you're an American, if you grew up in this country, if you've lived in this country for any period of time, you know full well that America is very much a live and let live society. It's just how people are generally, that everybody minds their own business. Yeah, people get together in public places and whatnot, and everybody cooperates together. That's just kind of how America is. But the, the radical left, they're not content, uh, and they're not going to be content. They're fighting, scratching, and clawing for power. And the Muslims have all but admitted, not all but, they have admitted 
that they want to take over the country. There's no question about that. There's no question. And I think what David Horowitz is, what he's saying has merit in the sense that if either Islam or the Marxists get control of a Christian country, they will seek to destroy Christianity. They will seek to destroy the preaching of the gospel and the practice of the Christian faith. It won't just be a matter of, well, they'll be in charge and then you go live in your quiet Christian neighborhood and everything's okay. No, they will actively not just persecute Christians, but then try to trample the preaching of the gospel into oblivion, try to get rid of it. Um, uh, for Here's a statistic. I've heard similar statistics to this. Uh, but just look at Russia, Russia that was under the Soviet Union for about 70 years. In 1917, when they had the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, prior to the revolution, there were some 55,173 Russian Orthodox churches in Russia and about 29,593 chapels. So 55,000 churches and 29,000 chapels in Russia, all across Russia. That's 1917. By the time you get to 1985, there are less than 7,000 churches total that was reported. That's the difference between 1917 to 1985. And in the culture, in the schools, in the colleges, throughout the whole country of Russia, under Soviet communism, Christianity, faith in God, any authority of the Bible, all of it was systematically trampled into the ground. Now, uh, we are told that Russians are reclaiming their Christian heritage. And uh, I, I remember reading about this from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He talked about how even though the communists tried to really destroy Christianity, they, they claimed that they believed in religious freedom. That's what they would profess. But in practice, that's just not what happened. And there were thousands of uh, churches that were either closed. Uh, there were church buildings that uh, were destroyed, many of them. Uh, and it's believed that the czar, that the reason that the czar and his family were killed uh, was because they were Christian, because they professed Christianity. And uh, today, the, the czar and his family, they've been declared martyrs in the Russian Orthodox Church. If you haven't seen the series on Netflix, The Last of the Czars, uh, that series is really, really fantastic. It's very well done, uh, and it gives a very powerful history of the final days of the last czar of Russia and the things that were happening, and really the, the sort of tragic decisions that were being made by the czar and how he lost the support of, well, really the military. That's what did it, when, at least based on what the series uh, reveals. It's, it's kind of a uh, a docudrama, a lot of dramatic, you know, with actors and sets and everything, very well done. But then you've got experts that come in and they offer commentary. And uh, I really learned a lot about the, the Bolshevik revolution and how the czar and his family were removed. A lot of things I did not know. And, uh, and so I highly recommend it if you want to learn what happened and learn more about the Bolshevik Revolution. I've also learned that Russians, the Russian people, don't like the idea of calling it the Russian Revolution. I used to call it both, uh, but they don't like calling it the Russian Revolution because they don't believe, many of them, that it represents Russia. They believe that it represents this foreign element that was at work in their country. And as we're watching socialism and radical leftism in America, I think many of us can relate to that idea. What these radical leftists are promoting is not America. It's not American values. It has nothing to do with our constitution, our heritage, our history, our faith, any of it. In fact, they're trying to trample all of that in the ground. 
And if you study what happened in Russia, that's very much what happened to their culture that had centuries of Christianity. And it was all overturned practically overnight. And uh, But now it is said they are recovering themselves from it. So they don't like calling it the Russian Revolution. They prefer the term Bolshevik Revolution because that more accurately represents what they believe happened. All right, let's go to our commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the recognition by the United States of the Armenian genocide. When we come back right after this article on front page mag, uh, an article written by Raymond Abraham. And the headline is the other genocide of Christians on Turks, Kurds, and Assyrians lessons past and present. Now the article goes into the fact that during what is called the Armenian genocide, the Armenian Christians were killed, but there were also Greeks and Assyrians who were persecuted and killed during this genocide as well. And I think the article is worth reading because there's a lot of uh, important information that's communicated there. But uh, the article says, one of the most refreshing aspects of resolution 296, which acknowledges the Armenian genocide and which the House recently voted overwhelmingly for, is that it also recognizes those other peoples who experienced a genocide under the Ottoman Turks. The opening sentence of Resolution 296 acknowledges, quote, the campaign of genocide against Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Syriacs, Aramaeans, Maronites, and other Christians. Uh, the article goes on, it says, and that last word, Christians, is key to understanding this tragic chapter in history. Okay, and then it goes on to talk about the, uh, really, the persecution against Christianity. There's, there's no question, brothers and sisters, that in the world today, and for many, many years, the most persecuted group in the world are Christians, all over the world. Uh, more so than any other group. We're constantly hearing about the dangers, the alleged dangers to Muslims being persecuted because of so-called Islamophobia. Or we're told that supposedly gays are going to be persecuted because of homophobia. Uh, now they're arguing that transgenders are going to be persecuted because of transphobia etc. And it just goes on and on and on. There's one group of people after another that we are told is in danger of uh, persecution, but none of them come anywhere close. I mean, there, there are reports that it's about 80% of people who are persecuted over matters of religion are Christian. That's one report. And we should say that when, when you see these kind of reports that are done, the numbers will often vary, but there have been university studies that have been done for years that make it very, very clear. Christianity throughout the world, whether you're going to go to China, North Korea, whether you're going to be in India, whether you're going to be throughout the Middle East, Africa, etc., Christian people are persecuted throughout the world. Uh, and it is, it, it's, on, on the one hand, it is, it's tragic because we we love our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. We don't want to see them persecuted. But at the same time, we also know it is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It's, it is the fulfillment of what we read about in Revelation, the souls under the offer, the, sorry, under the altar, the souls under the altar who were killed for the word of God. And they cry out, how long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not avenge our deaths on those who dwell upon the earth? Uh, and it's, I've always found that very, very powerful because you would think once they're in heaven, they're just going to be at peace. And uh, of course, they'll, uh, you know, not hold a grudge for anything. Uh, or so you would think. And I'm not sure if holding a grudge is the right term, but they have not forgotten that they were persecuted and killed they were murdered, martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and they're still calling out for God's justice upon those who persecuted them and did to them what they did. And of course, when we read some of the accounts of the things that happened, I mean, uh, the, the torment and the suffering that the Armenian Christians were put through uh, in this genocide, uh, some of the testimonies of the Armenians, who many years later, they remember it. They, they, they were children, they were very young, they saw their family members killed, and it's very, very powerful. It is, it's obvious they're not able to let it go because there was no accountability. And the acknowledgement by the United States, which is the most powerful country in the world, uh, through House Resolution 296, this is a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, this, this long journey that goes all the way back to the Clinton administration uh, of getting the United States to officially acknowledge the Armenian genocide. This is something that has come up over and over and over again, one administration after another. And when it looks like it's getting ready to officially be acknowledged by both the House, the Senate, and then the White House, it is somehow or other interrupted and shut down because of all of the uh, politics with Turkey. Okay? And this has now happened again. This is why people were talking about uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and how it was Lindsey Graham who blocked the recognition of the Armenian genocide and basically did so because of a conversation, it is said, because of a conversation with uh, Erdogan. And of course, all this has to do with the politics of Turkey and the Turkish leaders. Uh, they do not want the United States to officially acknowledge the Armenian genocide. In Turkey, it is apparently illegal for you to publicly go around talking about the Armenian genocide. They, they won't let you do that there. Now, this article from the Washington Post talks about how the issue is like a, it's a tool of manipulation. At one point, it says this, it says, quote, most recently, Newsweek reported that the Trump administration considered threatening Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, with U.S. recognition of the Armenian genocide if the Turkish army invaded northern Syria following the U.S. military withdrawal. After Turkish forces swept into northern Syria, congressional leaders, incensed by Ankara's belligerence, announced that a vote on the most recent iteration of the Armenian Genocide Resolution will be considered this week. Okay, that was October 28th. Now... That takes us to October 29th and House Resolution 296. House Resolution 296, uh, which starts out with the words, quote, whereas the United States has a proud history of recognizing and condemning the Armenian genocide, the killing of 1.5 million Armenians by the Ottoman Empire from 1915 to 1923, and providing relief to the survivors of the campaign of genocide against Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Syriacs, Aramaeans, Maronites, and other Christians. And then it goes on from there to acknowledge the Honorable Henry Morgenthau, United States Ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, uh, led protests by officials of many countries against what he described as the empire's, quote, campaign of race extermination. That's how Morgenthau called it. And uh, he was the ambassador to the Ottomans. Whether or not this House resolution is going to make it past the Senate because of now the politics going on. And, the, and, and, and again, there are those who believe this issue should not be a political weapon or, or, or tool of manipulation like this. That it's, it's just something that should be acknowledged. I think it's an important acknowledgement, not just for the Armenian Genocide, but for the persecution of Christians throughout the Middle East and Africa by Islam and the fact that the Muslims routinely persecute Christians throughout the world and are still persecuting them every day. Uh, I'm not sure that it really matters one way or the other if the Senate and if President Trump signs it. I think it would matter somewhat, but the fact that there is a written record in the House of Representatives uh, by at least one 
part of the United States government, I think is significant. It's a significant witness. But really, the redemption that all believers in Christ, that we all look for, is not really the redemption of any man or any government. The Bible says, put not your trust in princes, but rather our hope in this life and in the life to come is in God himself and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, brethren, we are out of time. That's going to do it for us today. That is our show. We'll stop it there, but we will be back next time as the Lord leads us. Until then, God bless you guys. I'm Chris Pinto, and you've been listening to Noise of Thunder. Confiscation. Why do they want to confiscate the guns? Because they know the semi-automatic rifle is the most common type of battle rifle in the world. I mean, it is it is essentially the modern equivalent to the musket during the time of the American Revolution. That's that's what it is. And they know that small arms guerrilla groups around the world rely upon similar weapons when they have had their resistance movements. I mean, this would include, you know, Vietnam. Uh, they know you had a bunch of rice farmers in Vietnam, but they had AK-47s and they fought against the most powerful country in the world for almost 20 years and ultimately won. Uh, same thing happened in Afghanistan when, when uh, the Afghan rebels fought against the Soviet Union. They just fought them year after year after year. Finally, the Soviets got tired and went home. Uh, this is what they're concerned about. They're concerned that the American people with the semi-automatic rifles are simply not going to be able to be subdued in the way that the socialists want to subdue them. Now, it's important to remember that the Constitution and the Second Amendment does not provide the right to bear arms. It only acknowledges it. The right comes from God. That's why it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It does not say the Constitution provides for the people's right to keep and bear arms. It doesn't say that. Uh, you can look at the case, the United States versus uh, Krugshank from 1875, where the court said, quote, the right to bear arms is not granted by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. So the court acknowledged, and you can read the whole case, but the court acknowledged that the right to bear arms is not granted and it, it does not rely upon the Constitution of the Second Amendment in order to exist. That's a key point. It's one that your staunch defenders of the Second Amendment make over and over and over again. A lot of Americans are still not aware that that's the case, that the way it's worded in the Second Amendment is very particular and it's very intentional, that it's a right that comes from God it's part of God's natural law. We find it in the Holy Scripture again and again. And we're not going to go over all that on this program. But nevertheless, you find many examples in the Bible. All the go study Abraham in the Old Testament. When, uh, when Lot is kidnapped and Abraham, he arms his young men who were trained in matters of war. And they go and they make war and they rescue Lot. And then Abraham is afterward, he's, he's blessed by Melchizedek, who is a, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And it's Melchizedek who blesses Abraham right after this great battle. This is part of the reason why it's considered a natural right. It, it is part of what God had uh, enabled the early generations after Noah why? Because when Noah gets off the ark, God says, if man sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. In order for men to carry out that command, they must be armed. All right, before we went to the break, we were talking about the issue with Poland and the fact that Poland now has passed, reportedly, an anti-pedophilia law. This is reported on the website Church Militant. Uh, Poland is a Catholic country. Although they have some very, I mean, there are some bold people in Poland. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. But very quickly, uh, Church Militant 
uh, reports Poland passes anti-pedophilia law and angry leftists claim it will prevent sex education. You see, they're basically admitting that pedophilia and sex education, that they're, they're both moving in the same direction. And uh, this article says Polish lawmakers are proposing a law criminalizing the sexualization of children. On Wednesday, Poland's ruling conservative law and justice party passed a law called Stop Pedophilia, which criminalizes the promotion of underage sexual activity. It's now scheduled to go to a parliamentary committee to discuss specific ways it will be implemented. Now, I sent an email after I saw this. I sent an email to Dr. Judith Reisman, and I asked her about this, and I said, didn't you tell me that our film, The Kinsey Syndrome, was being shown in Poland, and it was getting all of this response and whatnot? And she wrote me back, and Dr. Reisman said, yes, it's the legal group that I was working with also, because she had gone over there, because she's in our film. And... Uh, they, they invited her to go over there and speak and they had a march outside, you know, and a, and a protest and this kind of thing. And now the legal group that was working with Dr. Reisman, they are the ones who are apparently responsible for putting this law together. So praise the Lord, the work that we did on that film, we spent three and a half years working on it. Uh, it had an impact in Croatia. They got a Supreme Court decision after a year's uh, debates and so on. Uh, as a result of Carolina Kristoff, the Croatian journalist, showing that film on her news program, and it caused an uproar over there. Dr. Reisman went over, etc. Similar situation. Now it's recently happened here in Poland, or I should say there in Poland, where they apparently showed the film. They did a... Uh, a Polish language translation where they did Polish subtitles on the film and it was shown and there were groups that talked about it and they flew Dr. Reisman over there who met with a legal team and now they have taken action in Poland. Praise the Lord. We really hope this goes through and protects the children and the families in that part of the world. Uh, we need to see a similar kind of revolution happen here in our country through the courts and drive out uh, the, the predators from our education system and from doing things like Drag Queen Story Hour because the situation is getting worse and worse. Now, some of you will remember some time ago, it's been more than a year, I played the audio from this really, really bold young Polish woman. Poland has a very strong history. Uh, it was the great Polish king, uh, Jan Sobieski, who fought uh, with his winged warriors that came in and uh, fought and defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Vienna, the very famous Battle of Vienna, where the siege at Vienna was happening for a prolonged period of time. And then King Sobieski rides in and he defeats the Muslims and drives them back. That is said to be one of the defining victories in Western civilization, because if the Muslims had been successful at Vienna, they would have then been able to invade the rest of Western Europe, something they've been trying to do for more than a thousand years. That's what's so important to understand. Well, I showed some time ago, or I featured uh, on our Noise of Thunder Radio website under the videos there, a video of a Polish woman, a young Polish woman, speaking out. She was a professing Christian, and she said, here in Poland, Jesus Christ is king. You will bring none of your Sharia law to our country, because we're not going to allow it. And she was very, very bold. Well, sometime after I uh, highlighted that video, YouTube took it down. They claimed it somehow or other violated hate speech boundaries or something like that. Well, I found a different version of it and have uploaded it to the Noise of Thunder Radio website, which you can find at noiseofthunderradio.com. And you should go, the, the, the entire speech is over 14 minutes long. It's really fantastic. It is very inspirational because it's very faith-filled. And she's 
definitely exposing the evils of Islam and also denouncing the leadership in the Catholic churches because she recognizes as her, those who are with her who are all part of this cause, uh, they recognize that uh, they are being betrayed by leadership in both church and state. That's what's happening in the Western world. I call it the Judas Iscariot Coalition. And yes, we can talk about the Jesuits, we can talk about Catholic bishops, but any, but any of us in the evangelical Protestant community, we know full well that there are problems in the Protestant evangelical churches, in Lutheran churches, the Baptist churches. I mean, it is all over the place. It has spread like leaven uh, throughout all of the churches, or most all of them. Uh, now, that doesn't, that's not to say that there are no faithful congregations. I believe there are. Uh, those who are standing strong on the gospel and on the word of God, and they're not going to back down, and they're not going to compromise. Yes, there are still faithful men of God who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Uh, and we're not going to bow the knee to Baal. And, uh, and I, but, but I encourage you to go and watch this video before they take it down again, uh, because this is so powerful and inspirational, what she says. And she's talking, she's very, very, I mean, she's just very bold. And she's talking about all the wickedness and all the evil and what they're doing. And they're, they're raping and they're murdering and they're doing all of these atrocities. And then the, the, the men begin to shout and they say, we will protect our Polish children, right? And I want to play a little bit of what she said, just so you can hear. You can hear this and then I'll try to, I'll, I'll read the subtitles. Listen. They burn villages and towns. Children are burned alive. For years they've been murdering in the name of Allah. It's an open war with Christianity. They won't have any mercy for us. They will slaughter everybody. Our church systematically destroyed. She's saying that the church, our church, she's saying, by which she means the Catholic church, has forgotten about its role to protect our values. And then she says, and when the time comes to pull out the sword, like the Saint Michael the Archangel defending his faith and throw the evil into hell. Unfortunately, today's Catholic Church hierarchs kneel down not before our God, but it is us who are a living Church of Jesus Christ. We constitute a Church and we will fight till the end. When necessary, we will stand in defense of our faith whatever this fight could bring to us. Our shield, our holy faith. No, she says, our shield is our holy faith. Our weapon is nationalism. Okay? Our shield is our holy faith. Our weapon is nationalism. But it's, it's just really powerful that she's acknowledging that they as believers are the church. I mean, that is, that's Protestant evangelical biblical teaching. Right there, because the Roman teaching is that, no, it's only the Church of Rome. It's only if you're in submission to the papacy and the cardinals and whatnot. That's supposedly the church. But, of course, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple is you are. That's what the apostle said to the early church. And then from there is when she goes on and she talks about how Anjim Chowdhury had said he's going to bring Sharia law to Poland and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, she said, you will not bring any of your Sharia laws here. We're not going to let you. Okay. She was very, very bold, very, very passionate and very, very high. It's just so great to see believers in Christ declaring the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is in charge, not Allah, not the corrupt apostate leaders, whether they're in the church or the traitors that are operating in the state 
It doesn't matter. It's God himself. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is King of Kings. And as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't bow before any man, any evil, wicked person who is in rebellion against Almighty God. I mean, this is how the Reformation happened. Because Bible believers were reading the Scripture and they're looking at the church leadership. I mean, remember, the Reformers began as Catholics who saw all this corruption going on with the popes and the cardinals and so on. And they started reading the Bible and then recognizing, wait a minute, what they're doing, that's not the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. And then they began demanding reforms. And that's what happened. It, that's what ultimately led to the Great Reformation. So in a sense, what's happening is tragic uh, because we hate to see a betrayal of the faith. But on the other hand, it's great to see that people are being stirred up and they're recognizing that we have to stand uh, and fight for the faith once we're all delivered to the saints. All right. Well, we are out of time, brethren. We, we've run long today. We've run long. But uh, I, I, I'm very passionate about these issues. I think as Christians, we have to remember what the Bible says. The righteous are as bold as a lion. And that's what we need. We need to be bold as a lion for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the word of God, and for the defense of Christian liberty in the world, because that's what's in peril right now. And these powers, whether it's the socialists, the communists, or the Islamists, those who want political Islam and Sharia, and the sodomites, the homosexuals, they all are making war on the gospel of Jesus Christ they all are making war on Christianity. And they're doing it in different ways. On the, on, on, in some ways, they are directly opposing Christianity. In other ways, they are counterfeiting Christianity, presenting a false version of Christianity uh, and uh, trying to use that to supplant the true faith. But we've got to resist them on both sides and stay in prayer and trust the Lord and remember what the Lord says, Ye shall not fear other gods, but only fear the Lord, and he shall deliver us from the hands of all our enemies. All right, brethren, that is it for us today. That is our show. We'll stop it there, but we will be variety of things. We're going to talk about what's going on with these Democratic debates, with the Democratic Party, and their ongoing threats against the Christian community, against the patriot community. Now they are threatening uh, to remove a, a tax exemption from churches that refuse to perform gay marriages. The LGBT movement is a political weapon. There's no question for the radical left, for the Marxists, the socialists, and now the Muslims who are working with the socialists, even though the Muslims certainly don't agree with so-called gay rights. Nevertheless, they are working alongside the Marxists right now because the Marxists, that's their doorway into American politics. And we've talked about this before. This is what they're doing in Belgium. Uh, we've we played the audio of the Belgian official saying that in Belgium, the Muslims, they worked with the socialists initially. And then once they built up their numbers, they split off and now they formed an Islam party there in Belgium, and they're proclaiming their desire to bring in Sharia law and to turn Belgium into an Islamic state. Okay, you've got that going on on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, you've got the homosexual movement, the LGBT movement. You've got the case in Texas, uh, just an unbelievable case going on in Texas where a father a father who is now divorced from his wife, which you can understand, because the woman he was married to is an absolute psychopath. They have two sons, and she has been telling one of her two sons since he was about three years old that he is a girl. But he's a girl. And now he's about seven years old, and she wants to transition him from being a boy into a girl. She wants to have him castrated and begin the process of physically altering his body 
to make him into a girl, essentially, while he's a child. And the courts in Texas, of all places, I just still can't believe this is going on in Texas. You would think California or maybe Massachusetts or someplace like that, this kind of craziness. But Texas, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, but there it is. Texas has these liberal left-wing areas. And now you have a father who actually has to go into court and argue before a judge why he does not want his son transitioned by his psychotic mother into a girl. This is an underage child. And his rights as a parent to demand that the laws of God be upheld. You see, this is why this is why I've been talking about this so much, brethren, and why I've been researching the situation with the founding of our country and the importance of the law of God on the development of the free world. This is something that we're going to be talking about continually in this new film that, yes, we're still in editing. I've worked on the editing today. Uh, we're trying to get this thing done before the end of the year. The true Christian history of America. We've got a lot of material. We've got a lot of great footage. Got some powerful footage for this new film. Uh, we've got, you know, you know, great interviews, all these different new, never before seen interviews, new footage, new everything. It's going to be very exciting uh, once we get true Christian history of America uh, completed. But we talk about the whole development of freedom and how the Bible and the law of God, understanding the Bible and the law of God and fighting for it. This was the fight of our Christian forefathers for hundreds of years, even before the American Revolution, long beforehand. And now what the globalists are trying to do is they are trying to dismantle the particular elements that were developed, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press. They're going after them one at a time. And they're going after the right to bear arms. That's becoming more and more apparent. It was a conspiracy theory 10 years ago. I mean, people probably said it was a conspiracy theory five years ago. The idea of gun confiscation in our country. But now they are openly proclaiming gun confiscation. They began to do it when Hillary was running for president. And it was brought up to her, the idea of the Australian-style a buyback program and Hillary said she was up for that and that's where it began to be introduced here in the past couple of years now it has gone full throttle with confiscation and now we've got Beto O'Rourke and here let's uh, let me play some of the audio from the now famous Beto O'Rourke a democratic debate and what he said. Listen to this. You said, quote, Americans who own AR-15s and AK-47s will have to sell them to the government, all of them. You know, the critics call this confiscation. Are you proposing taking away their guns and how would this work? I am. If it's a weapon that was designed to kill people on a battlefield. Liberal yeah. audience. The high impact, high velocity round when it hits your body shreds everything inside of your body because it was designed to do that so that you would bleed to death on a battlefield and not be able to get up and kill one of our soldiers. When we see that being used against children, and in Odessa, I met the mother of a 15-year-old girl who was shot by an AR-15, mm -hmm. and that mother watched her bleed to death over the course of an hour because so many other people were shot by that AR-15 in Odessa and Midland. There weren't enough ambulances to get to them in time. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. Okay, so that is the now famous uh, speech, of course. And he's, uh, he's making, you know, a reference to a terrible tragedy that took place. And everybody agrees that it was a tragedy. Uh, but the only reason that it's magnified is because the media grabs it and they play it over and over and over again. If CNN and MSNBC went down to the abortion clinics and they showed uh, the results of abortion and they were playing that round the clock, 24 hours a day uh, with with the tens of thousands and more 
uh, children that are being killed by the abortion industry. Then you have the LGBT movement, the homosexual movement that's infecting reportedly about 50,000 people a year with AIDS. Many of them underage children are being infected with HIV. And here they're doing things like drag queen story hour. Uh, you could tell stories of much, much greater atrocities affecting far more people as a result of these leftist policies that have been implemented in our country for years now. All right, so here is a statistic that I um, stumbled upon here recently. This is, this is given recently by a representative from the NRA, from the NRA, and he gave these statistics. Knife deaths in our country, and this according to this NRA source, 1,515 knife deaths per year. Fist and feet, people killed because of fists and feet, 672 per year. From hammers, 443. 443 annually from hammers. Rifle deaths, and this is all rifles. This is not just the AR-15, but it's all rifles. That would be shotguns, hunting rifles, every kind of rifle, 297, 297 a year in our country from rifles. The number is so low, especially when you consider our population, where, where we have over 320 million people in our country. That is a massive amount of people to have. And to have less than 300 people a year dying from rifle deaths? You see, they inflate the numbers. They'll sit here and they'll say, oh, 30,000 people a year, and this kind of thing. They're not revealing the fact that 98 to 99% of those gun-related homicides have nothing to do with a rifle. They're almost all of them are from handguns in one way or another. Then you have two more issues. One is that, that two-thirds of the numbers that they give, this 30,000 a year number that they give, 19 to 20,000 of those are suicide. 19 to 20,000 are suicide. Then from the, the additional 10 to 12,000, it fluctuates, you know, 10, 11, 12,000, something like that, where you have gun-related homicides, uh, most of those for, are from your drug gangs in places like Chicago and L.A. and New York, etc., and almost always the firearms that they're using were not purchased at a sporting goods store. They were bought on the black market, on the street, illegally. So they're illegal arms anyway. They're not legally purchased firearms. But most of them are not rifles. Rifles are used for very few crimes in our country, generally speaking. And the reason is, is kind of obvious because it's very difficult to conceal any rifle. People use rifle, rifles mainly for hunting and for going to the range. That's, that's where they use rifles. Uh, but what's the real reason they want to go after semi-automatic rifles and why they keep referring to them as weapons of war? This is a socialist agenda. They want to prevent patriots in our country from being able to defend themselves against the increasing oppression that they are planning to increase one year after another, if they can get away with it. They are bringing in the Muslims. They are going to advance Sharia law, and they are advancing this LGBT agenda to the point where they are planning to legalize pedophilia. That is their plan, and they know that American parents in this country are not going to tolerate it beyond a certain point. Already, we're seeing parental rights being destroyed. But what they're doing, brothers and sisters, I have to warn you, I studied this for years. We made the documentary The Kinsey Syndrome more than 10 years ago. And I'm telling you, I have watched this thing progress. And the stuff that we learned while working on that film, I have just seen it coming to pass more and more and more. And what they are planning to do is they are going to take all of this LGBT uh, sexual orientation legal argument, all of that they're going to take, and they're going to apply it to pedophilia. And then the same way that you're seeing parental rights being destroyed in the courts over sexual orientation, the same is going to happen where pedophilia is concerned. And parents who have kids who are being molested by pedophiles 
are going to not be able to protect their kids. That's what's going to happen because the courts are going to tell them you as the parent are a danger to your child for trying to stop your child from being involved with a pedophile. That's where they're headed because that was Kinsey's whole argument. Kinsey's argument, always remember this. This is what's driving this transgender case in Texas. This is why they've got these bans on uh, what they call gay conversion therapy. Now they will not allow parents to take their kids to a counselor to get professional counseling to help them overcome their feelings if they have homosexual feelings. You can't get counseling for that. You, if your little boy wants to dress up like a girl, uh, the courts will forbid you from stopping him as a parent. And you see, they're laying the groundwork for what comes next. And what comes next was defined by Alfred Kinsey. Kinsey said that the problem with pedophiles and children is not the pedophile, he said, it's the parent. That was Kinsey's whole argument. It's the parent. Because when the parent gets upset, he said, that is what does all the harm to the children. And that is what they're operating on. And they are advancing that agenda in our legal system. And every parent in the country should be concerned about this. All right. We are going to go to our commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's happening in Poland, where Polish leaders have stood up and they were influenced by what? By our film, The Kinsey Syndrome. So we were told by Dr. Reisman. And now they have passed a law against pedophilia in Poland. We're going to talk about that when we come back right after this. Now, Pope Francis the Jesuit, we have to emphasize the fact that he is a Jesuit because now we have another example of Jesuit sophistry. Uh, Pope Francis is now on record through a friend, through hearsay, a friend of his who happens to be an atheist has said that Pope Francis privately has revealed his belief that Jesus Christ is not really God. That is that is the story. In fact, I, I saw this story. The story was forwarded to me by one of our listeners, but it first showed up, or at least I saw it first, on the website churchmilitant.com, which is, as I've said before, a very conservative Catholic website. And they're very, very Catholic there, for those who have never heard me talk about them before. And they are very much against the Protestant Reformation. You need to know that if you go to their website. But a lot of what you'll see there are conservative issues that we would agree to um, generally. But they are they take a strong stand against a lot of the obvious heresies in the modern Catholic Church, like this one. Uh, and so, uh, on church militant, they had featured the story. In fact, they've, they've, they've done it several times, uh, on church militant. They have a headline where they are quoting Eugenio Scalfari, Eugenio Scalfari, who is an Italian journalist and editor of the news magazine, La Espresso, former member of parliament in the Italian chamber, chamber of deputies and co-founder of the newspaper La Repubblica. Okay. In the past, in 2018, he wrote an article that had to deal with Pope Francis, uh, stating that the Pope made claims to the effect that hell did not exist. Later, he backpedaled that story. And we're seeing kind of the same thing happen now. Scalfari has also said that in his private conversations with Pope Francis, Pope Francis has communicated that Jesus was not really God. Now, remember, Scalfari is an atheist. He's an atheist. But he has met with and spoken to the Pope on a number of occasions. But now we have once again the back and forth. We have the, the arguments and the denials. This is just, it's, it's, it's unfolding just like the issue of homosexuality, where Pope Francis had said, who am I to judge? Then all of the liberals, the Jesuits and the homosexuals, they grabbed that and they ran with it. And they took it as a, a statement of approval toward homosexuality from the Pope. Meanwhile, the conservatives 
were it given that plausible deniability that they wanted so they can come out and say, well, no, the Pope did not actually say that he approves of homosexuality. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying we should not be judgmental, et cetera, et cetera. And then they give this whole plausible deniability argument. Then later on, uh, Pope Francis did the same thing over atheism. He made comments about atheists to the effect that atheists go to heaven, or so it sounded like. And then you had people proclaiming that, yes, even atheists go to heaven, even if they don't believe the gospel, even, even if they don't believe in God. And then you had the conservatives turning it around and saying, well, wait a minute, the Pope didn't actually say that atheists go to heaven. That's not specifically what he said, etc., etc. And then they backpedal. This has happened on one issue after another, after another, after another. And it is, if you know the history of the Jesuit order, this is Jesuit sophistry. This is Jesuit casuistry. This is Jesuit manipulation of ideas. But what has happened since, for example, let's just take the issue of homosexuality. What has happened? That issue has advanced it's advancing even now in our American political system. We have for the first time in our history a, a, an out and proud homosexual man who is who claims he's married to another man, and this guy is running for president. They just had a town hall meeting where they're bringing all the Democrat politicians and they're asking them if they will do away with tax exemption for churches if those churches do not agree to perform homosexual weddings. So they're, they're increasing the, the attacks on conservatives and on Christians in the country. And of course, we have to remember, this is why it's so important to know your Bible, brethren, and to know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and to realize, to recognize that what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah, as we read in the book of Jude, is set forth as a warning to all the nations of the earth. And this problem of the Sodomites, this goes back thousands of years. The Sodomites have tried to take control of societies and of God's temple in ancient Jerusalem, where we read in, in the days of King Josiah, they built up their houses along the walls of the temple there in Jerusalem. Think about why they were there. We're not given too many details in the scripture, but that's where they chose to build their houses. What are they doing now? They're infiltrating the churches even now. I've talked about before on this program how during the Dark Age, many of the priests, it was said, uh, who ran the Inquisition were homosexuals. They were sodomites. All right, now here is a quote. Here's a quote from Martin Luther. And you can find this on a website. There's a website called The Reformation Room. And they published an article called Martin Luther, Catholicism and the Practice of Sodomy. And they're quoting Luther, where Luther is talking about this corruption among the Roman clergy. And he's talking about a certain bull that was published under Pope Leo. And he says at one point, he says, quote, in the same bull, they decided that a cardinal should not keep as many boys in the future. However, Pope Leo commanded that this be deleted. Otherwise, it would have been spread throughout the whole world how openly and shamelessly the Pope and the cardinals in Rome practice sodomy. He goes on further down. He says, quote, this vice is so prevalent among them that recently a pope caused his own death by means of this sin and vice. In fact, he died on the spot. And quote, and then he goes on from there. And uh, he just lambasts the, uh, the popes and the cardinals. At one point, he called uh, a certain pope a sodomite and a transvestite. Pope Paul III, I think it was, the same pope that commissioned the Jesuit order. And look at what's happening now. Look at what's happening where you have Rome joining with Islam. You have the homosexual, militant homosexuality with the Democratic Party and with the Vatican and the Jesuits, etc. They're all working together. How did King Henry VIII drive out the Inquisition from England? By passing the Buggery Act of 1533. That allowed him to confiscate land from 
those who were guilty of homosexuality and to throw them out of the country. That's what Henry did to drive out because he knew many of these priests and monks and so on were sodomites. And so that's the weapon that he developed politically to drive them out. And then when Bloody Mary came in, she overturned the buggery act so that she could bring back the homosexual priests and then start burning Christians at the stake. It is not a coincidence, brethren, that the homosexuals are going after the Christian community. This goes back to ancient Sodom and Gomorrah when they charge down to Lot's house and they're banging on the door. Notice, they didn't just stay at, in their own homes and mind their own business. They don't do that. They don't do They want power and control, power and control to enforce their vile lusts on other people. And that's why they're going down to the libraries. That's why they're trying to recruit uh, children with drag queen story hour and all of this other crazy insanity. I mean, these people should be arrested and thrown in jail. And it's, it's uh, this is this is the one major failing, just so we understand, of the Trump administration. There are certain things that we have to be thankful for because Trump is in office, because he's he is stopping the 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 flood of globalism and socialism in our country. He's he's not completely stopping it, but at least he is delaying it for a time. But he is still cooperating with the homosexual movement, not as much as the Democrats, but still in cooperation with it. And the reality is the whole thing should be shut down because it's entirely unconstitutional. It's ungodly. It has no place in our country. I, I've said for years, the homosexual movement in our country would not have the kind of political power that it does without the help of Rome and her Jesuit order, because they are the ones I believe who have developed the, the arguments the, the sophistry, the, the manipulative arguments about equality. And really, it's a false equality. But it's been very, very cleverly done. It's been put into the schools, the colleges, the universities, and now, sadly, into many churches. Now, here's a couple of stories on this. And then we're going to go back to this story on Pope Francis, and we're going to talk about why the Vatican is going down this path of denying the divinity of Christ. But here's a couple of stories that have come out here in 2019. Uh, New York Post, 80% of priests in the Vatican are gay, based on a book titled In the Closet of the Vatican. In the Closet of the Vatican. Uh, quote, a total of about 80% of the most revered clerics in the Roman Catholic Church are homosexual despite the church's opposition to gay rights. According to the extensively researched book by French journalist Frederick Martel. Uh, the New York Times reported on the Vatican's gay overlords. The Vatican's gay overlords. Look up that article. Uh, Theguardian.com reported four in five Vatican priests are gay. Four in five Vatican priests are gay. I mean, this is, uh, this is, th these are staggering numbers. I mean, you, you've got to be kidding me. Four in five Vatican priests are gay. I remember years ago, Dr. Ian Paisley, in a sermon, said words to the effect that I think about 25% of the Catholic priesthood has AIDS. Here's another article from New York Mag, NewYorkMag.com. Gay priests and the lives they no longer want to hide. Gay priests and the lives they no longer want to hide. You see, they want to move this forward in the Catholic priesthood. They want to normalize this. They want to fully and completely normalize this. And eventually, uh, brothers and sisters, they want to normalize pedophilia. That's where they're headed with this whole thing. To normalize it and to legalize it. This is what they have in common with Islam. This is why all of this, the, the history of these movements, what the reformers believe were the two horns of the beast. And think about uh, what the book of Revelation says about mystery Babylon and the cup that she holds that are full of her abominations. 
how is homosexuality described in the scripture by God's law? In Leviticus, if man lies with a man as he lies with a woman, God says it is abomination. It's an abomination. If a man dresses up like a woman, God says all they that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. Think about that. In conjunction with Revelation and the cup of mystery Babylon full of abominations. Now, certainly we don't deny that there are other things that are called an abomination unto the Lord throughout the scripture. Idolatry in different places is called an abomination. And certainly we believe that's included. But we also believe it can be no coincidence that that word in particular is used to condemn homosexual practices. And here we find this happening in an overwhelming way inside the Vatican. Okay, we are going to go to our commercial break and we're going to talk more about this story. I'm going to give you some of the details on this story with Pope Francis and exactly what he said about the divinity of Christ when we return right after this. on the Church Militant website. Now, the reason I like to quote Church Militant on issues like this is because it is, it is too easy to claim that people who talk about these things are anti-Catholic or you're an anti-Catholic bigot and this kind of thing. If you go to Amazon.com and you look up our film, A Lamp in the Dark, there, and read the reviews, we have a lot of five-star reviews and so on. But then we'll get these one and two star reviews, and they're often from people who are accusing us of being anti-Catholic, that we're anti-Catholic bigots, etc., because we're reporting on the history of Rome and the Inquisition, etc. Uh, so that is why on an issue like this, I like to go to Catholic sources. What are Catholic news organizations saying about these things? Uh, well, the headline from Church Militant reads, Scalfare, Pope thinks Jesus was not God. That's the initial headline. And then you go down and it says, quote, Holy See quick to issue clarification, but won't deny pontiff's claims. Won't deny the pontiff's claims. Then uh, Church Militant, in their article, they say, quote, a journalist who frequently interviews Pope Francis claims the pontiff does not believe in Jesus as God. In an interview published in the Italian journal La Repubblica Tuesday, Eugenio Scalfari said of the pontiff, quote, those who, as it has happened many times with me, have had the luck of meeting him and speaking to him with the greatest cultural intimacy know that Pope Francis conceives Christ as Jesus of Nazareth, man, not God incarnate. Once incarnate, Jesus ceases to be a God and becomes a man until his death on the cross. End quote. Now that's the way it reads with Church Militant. Then the article says, uh, quote, he went on to say, Quote, when I had the chance of discussing these words, Pope Francis told me, quote, they are proven proof that Jesus of Nazareth, once having become a man, was, though a man of exceptional virtues, not at all a god. End quote. Then it goes on to say, the Holy See Press Office has since released a statement clarifying that Scalfari's text is not an accurate representation of the pontiff's words. As has been affirmed on other occasions, the words that Dr. Eugenio Scalfari attributes between quotes to the Holy Father during his colloquies held with him cannot be considered as a faithful account of what was effectively said. Now that's a statement from the Holy See, okay? Where, where it says, as has been affirmed on other occasions, etc. All right, so uh, that's a statement from the Holy See. That's not from Church Militant, just so we understand. Uh, and it goes on to say, this statement from the Holy See, uh, that the words represent rather a personal and liberal, loose interpretation of that which he heard, as appears entirely evident from what was written today concerning the divinity of Jesus Christ. 
Then Church Militant comments, and they say, quote, the statement fails to deny that Pope Francis disbelieves in the divinity of Jesus, a belief that would be heretical if he actually holds it. All right, then you can go over to Breitbart, Breitbart News. They've got an article that says, uh, Vatican beefs up denial of Pope Francis heresy. And this article says, quote, the Vatican has issued a stronger statement to refute claims alleging that Pope Francis has said Jesus Christ is not God, as there have been complaints of an earlier tepid response. The question, and we could go over all of this, but the, the, the real question is, what is the Vatican, and in particular the Jesuits, who remember the Jesuits run the Vatican, and they did even before Pope Francis got there. What are the Jesuits trying to do? What are they up to with this now, this next phase of uh, subversion in Western civilization? Well, let's go back in time. Let's go back to an article here about a Jesuit, a Jesuit named Roger Height, and Height is spelled H-A-I-G-H-T, an American Jesuit. And this is from an article on, on a website called fsspx.news, and it's information and analysis on the life of the church. And the headline says, United States Jesuit theologian forbidden to teach. And it goes on to say, quote, after a five-year inquiry, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has banned the American Jesuit Roger Height from teaching because of serious doctrinal errors. According to the American Catholic Agency, CNS, the condemnation by the Vatican is aimed at the book, Jesus symbol of God, which Father Height published in 1999. It deals with the divinity of Christ, the resurrection, the Trinity, and the salvation of non-Christians. If you go read the reviews on the book, I have not had an opportunity to read all the way through it, but I've read comments about the book. And basically, it is a very Jesuitical way of denying the exclusivity of Jesus Christ and the divinity of Christ. This is why those involved in the New Age and in occultism and so on, they are always trying to undermine the, the declaration of 1 Timothy 3.16, where we read, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. That is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, to try and justify the pagan religions where people are worshiping Buddha or Krishna or they're following Muhammad or whoever, they, they all want to try and make Jesus just like these other false messiahs, really and sort of bring him down to their level. And that is why they deny his divinity. And they even resent the idea of his divinity. But if you go and read the review of uh, this, uh, this Jesuit's book on Jesus' symbol of God, essentially that's what he's doing. He's pushing New Age ideology all right, now, just to show you that we're not the only ones who suspect that this is all, you know, that these kind of statements that have been made by the Pope over and over again are not accidental, that there is somehow or other an agenda at work, even though we may not completely understand it. Here's another Catholic website called 1 Peter 5, and they talk about this whole connection with Scalfari. Scalfari, who's an atheist and said to be a socialist as well. And yet the Pope has these multiple interviews with him, and he keeps coming out and giving these reports that are backpedaled afterwards. Uh, here's what the, the writer says. He says, quote, If you've also watched these developments for the past six years, it has no doubt become clear to you that the Pope is using Scalfare to propagate his most extreme ideas under a veneer of plausible deniability. Okay, that's what he says. 
So Catholics are realizing that this is what's going on, that this not, it, these statements are not just being made. They're being made quite deliberately, but they're using just what he says. And I just, just stumbled on this as I'm recording this program, and I couldn't believe he used the phrase plausible deniability, but that's, it's very, very Jesuitical what they're doing. It's, it's kind of a Hegelian manipulation tactic. And where it's all headed, brethren, we will have to wait and see. But we are out of time. That is going to do it for us today. That is our show. We'll stop it there, but we will be back next time as the Lord 